Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. James Lyons-Weiler coming to you from the WWDNYK studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Today is uh, Saturday, uh, January 30th, 2021. Uh, today's topic is pathogenic priming, disease enhancement, uh, adverse events from the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, we're going to be going over what I predicted in April as a result of my studies on the proteins that are in the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, in uh, <coughs> using bioinformatics and using uh, understanding which uh, proteins were antigenic and looking at the homology or similarity between the proteins in the virus and human proteins, specifically focused on which tissues we, could we expect to see uh, disease manifest, autoimmune disease, inflammatory disease, allergic disease, whatever you want to call it. And I know those things are very different medically, clinically. So I thought I would, instead of just me going through the um, the literature and look, reading the reports and looking at the news and, you know, reading the, all the information of the description of the symptoms that we're seeing in, in response to and reactions to COVID-19 vaccines, I thought I would ask someone who's got a medical background. So my guest today is Dr. Stephanie Christner. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? Hi, I'm very good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I wish we had a better, you know, a happier topic to talk about today. I certainly do. But I appreciate the time that you put in to look into this important question for us all. Uh, last week, as you know, I did an eight-hour webinar with other physicians uh, and doctors asking you know, and answering questions about things like treatment and data under reporting and, and, you know, important topics that are very important to the American public. So, um, first of all, uh, could you give us a little bit of background on who you are and your training and, you know, how you got interested in things like autoimmunity? Well, um, by training, I am a psychiatrist and I also um, did my internship in family medicine really how i got more involved in this was when my daughter passed away at six months old suddenly and unexpectedly and um immediately i ruled out all obvious causes me and the medical examiner and it was um, very obvious that it was vaccine related so i started exploring that and it led me to this um that's then terrific. I I, I, I'm, to I'm sorry to hear care. about that. I'm really sorry that that happened to you and your family. And uh, I'm very sorry that our society has decided to be so blunt headed uh, and, 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 and uh, inhumane about their reaction to deaths from vaccine. I'm sorry. No, thank you. Thank you. So it definitely. So, so, so you, you went on from that to, to look into what other things could be happening, I take it. And you've, you found Absolutely. Yeah. And when you lose a child and you have other children um, that you didn't realize were also damaged and you had no idea why they struggled so much, it's an endless research journey that really never ends. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, well, what, what I want to do for the listeners and for the viewers is to say, uh, you know, just to recap, what, what, what happened was I had some insight on the possibility uh, way back in February that if there were proteins in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, then those viral epitopes, mm -hmm. if humanity was exposed to the viral epitopes prior to getting an infection, or if they were exposed by infection prior to getting a vaccine, that there could be serious and critical illness and mortality in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And I postulated autoimmunities. And this was published in April in the uh, Journal of Translational Autoimmunity. Um, it has a table, and I don't, I, uh, it has a table, and in that table it has uh, various types of tissue, right? The, the whole paper is mm -hmm. here, uh, studied yeah, various, okay. various proteins, the epitopes, and, and various types of tissue on the right-hand side there. It's open access. All this research is paid for by the public through donations to IPAC. Um, and you and I were talking, and I said, well, you know, what do you think about having an independent look at all of the reports as they're coming out and see if they match and map to the specific uh, predictions that were made back in April, shortly after I published, of course, Darja Kanduk, 
uh, also came in with a different methodology. She, she uses a, a hexamer approach where she looks at small fragments of, of uh, peptides. I took an approach where I said, okay, first, what are the immunogenic epitopes? Within those epitopes, are there any significant matches? A different discovery method, both are valid. But and there are now many people that have cited my paper on pathogenic priming. I think that the citation rates up to 28 people, uh, independent teams around the world saying, you know, this is a, this is a potential, at least they're saying at least there's a potential problem. So, uh, Stephanie, uh, I, I guess um, you've been looking at this. What, what did you find? Uh, well, it's fascinating to me. Um, really, when we look at the adverse reactions we're seeing today with, uh, with the infection itself and with the vaccination, vaccination itself, we're seeing um, so many autoimmune responses in the various tissues which align with the peptides that you identified in the different systems that overlap with the SARS-CoV-2. And so humans. the spe those specific organ systems and their t the tissues they're in. So, right. So, Absolutely. So which one strike, once one jumps out at you is most important that started the, you know, the most striking? Uh, well, absolutely the lung. And we know that that's going to occur. And in the second study that you just mentioned, um, from she identifies quite a few um, of the specifics there. Then we're also seeing um, cardiac issues, vascular issues um, related either to hypercoagulability or lack of coagulability. And, so the, um, the coagulability, hypercoagulability would be, these are both types of coagulopathy. There, something's wrong with being able to coagulate or coagulating too easily, not being able to coagulate. Yeah. Um, we, I didn't know that we saw both of those happening here in, in exposures. Yes, I, I okay. have some literature on, on both of those, um, both hyper and hypo. Um, mm -hmm. and, and really, of course, it's very um, individually based on your genetic predisposition as to what you're going to form an auto antibody to. Yeah, that makes my that makes a lot of sense. So the people that are out there saying, you know, this these kinds of things might be anecdotal. Um, first of all, it, I've read so many reports of healthcare workers that have died after receiving the vaccine who had a prior COVID infection, and mm -hmm. it's this is the only type. This is the only time when consistently and reliably, regardless of the state that they die in or what hospital system they're with or their age or their gender, whether they were smokers or not smokers, uh, that medicine can't determine a cause of death. It's, it's strange, somebody that dies at that age and they say we can't determine a cause of death. And what that means, of course, is that they, in any other thing that would have hurt this person, they would have attributed causality without an issue. It's just taboo. Uh, to uh, to actually attribute the cause of death to that, but if somebody has to calculate the probability that this number of people around the country would accidentally die of that age, all in health, all in healthcare, uh, and it's and it's and it's uh, it's going to be astronomically small. I think that's my expectation. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got the we've got the lung, we've got coagulopathy, which is really important. Um, what else did you find? Um encephalitis, different brain abnormalities, transverse myelitis, um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, then Kawasaki's uh, definitely um, cardiac issues and vascular issues um, related to the endothelium. Yeah, okay, so we, we, we the, the skeptic in my study would say, well, you know, this is a hat trick, right? Because he, he knew that there would be reports of conditions that were coming out of the vaccine later on. And uh, so I actually just put the paper together somehow. I just slammed all these results into a table and published it and somehow got away <laughs> with it. In reality, I can assure you that my, my, my results are highly reproducible. They're very robust, but also, my specific means for choosing the tissue was I, I just looked at where those proteins are expressed in the body. There's a database that published by NCBI. I mean, this was, does, it wasn't rocket science, but I thought it was important to put a warning out 
uh, the specific warning wasn't don't vaccinate. It, it wasn't don't don't develop vaccines. It was if you're going to develop vaccines, take these unsafe epitopes out. That was my warning. Because right. people are already going to be exposed to the proteins, the epitopes one time. And, you know, if you take these unsafe epitopes out, if you do a mass vaccination program, then you're going to be exposing potentially far more people to the vaccine than would ever be infected with the virus. Uh, especially if you, you know, are successful, if the virus evolves a wave, you know, this kind of thing. So the, the, um, tell us about um, any any of the specific things like uh, in, in the brain, what the, the encephalopathy. Did you, you mentioned ADEM in our pregame. What, what's ADEM? Oh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Mm-hmm. So we, what we have seen with other vaccinations are these adverse reactions, all related to myelination. Yeah. And in, in, in this is previous research I've done on neurodevelopmental disorders. And when we get this um, chronic inflammatory reaction with these cytokines, in my opinion, and from research I've done, it, it can disrupt um, the oligodendrocytes, which are myelin making cells. And, um, and, and oftentimes, even on autopsy, you're not going to see demyelination per se. Right. And um, there's also literature out looking at, we always think of demyelination in white matter, where now we're learning more about the brain and seeing areas of gray matter that are affected. That's So, that's, so that, go ahead. That's particularly horrific when it happens. But I, I also found uh, and predicted adipose tissue, you know, cartilage. Mm-hmm other ubiquitous mm-hmm. tissues. So when somebody oh, goes sure. into anaphylaxis uh, like that, uh, anaphylaxis being, you know, nonspecific immune reactions, self autoimmune reactions, mm-hmm. muscle and so on. Um, uh, did you did you run into anything about the immune system itself? Because we all we know that there's a disruption of the immune system from the virus. What about from the vaccine? Do you see anything like that? Um, well, absolutely. When you when you get an artificial antibody, so to speak, um, you don't know if it's a neutralizing antibody or not. And then this antibody increases. It's something called odd, um, antibody uh, dependent. De- dependent enhancement. Right. And so what happens? <laughs> so, yeah, That's little a brain point. issue. Um, what, what happens is instead of just entering the cell through the ACE2 receptor, now they can use these different channels to get into the cell. So more of the virus gets into the cell and initially it can go to the nucleus and it can decrease our antiviral defenses. So we already can't defend against things. And then um, a little while later, you may see uh, these antibodies develop. And then when you're re-exposed to that natural virus, your body is going to react in an unpredictable way on a various tissue based on your genetics and propensity. Right, so all of our proteins are, uh, you know, inherited, uh, our ability to make proteins and the specific proteins that we make are encoded, encoded by our genomic sequence. Uh, they should be similar to mom and dad, but we all have mutations to make them different from mom and dad, so there's genetic variation in every generation. So what she's talking about is that there are um, different families probably have different propensity actually to different uh, different individuals, but different families probably have propensity to different types of autoimmunity when exposed to these kinds of epitopes. Um, and that would be a way to look at this specifically, I think, scientifically to see if it's uh, molecular mimicry. But there, we'll get into how to test for molecular mimicry and autoimmunity okay. in a little while. Um, I noticed looking at this, I haven't looked at this for a long time, but I have all the statin-related protein 1 isoform, which uh, is a protein that is essential for the proper placenta functioning. And there's, an, there's other concerns over placental uh, homology, uh, I guess because there it's not here. Sure. I mm-hmm. guess because it's not here, that means that the protein was is not uh, immunogenic. But I, I don't know if I missed it. It might have been a miss on my part. Uh, back to the immune system. Just the other day, I was talking with a doctor. I was actually invited to appear on a panel at a, a university out west, um, uh, and mm-hmm. it was a nighttime panel. It was hosted by the students. 
Uh, it was in, on the West Coast in California. And one of the doctors on the panel said that, yeah, he could relate to what was going on specifically because he found that one of his patients developed a B-cell autoimmunity um, following uh, exposure to the viral epitopes. In that case, it was due oh. to uh, infection. Um, but uh, so I predict, I certainly predicted that. In fact, I predicted a lot of that. There was, I think, 21% a, a, a of all the proteins that showed autoimmunity were, were involved in the immune system. So that, that, yeah. that should have raised a red flag. And we're raising the red flag again here today. You know, do you remember Zika with the microcephaly? Of course, who can forget it? Um, you know, right. the, the year after, the year after um, Zika was linked by the CDC to microcephaly, uh, Zika still flourished in Brazil, but microcephaly went away. So it wasn't the Zika virus, but nevertheless, they were developing um, a vaccine. And I did the same kind of analysis, but specifically in the brain. I didn't want. I restricted my analysis of the Zika virus proteins and compared them to proteins in the human brain. And I sent a letter to Dr. Anthony Fauci and I presented the results to Dr. Fauci just as a good American citizen would and said, Dr. Fauci, you know, he, he, and I did this because he announced that they were going to have the vaccine within a couple of weeks. And, uh, Dr. Fauci, um, received my letter and, it, and what I did was I, I said, if you, if you, you're, you're, I, I realized he was in charge of and coordinating vaccine development with all the vaccine makers. And I said, um, if you include, if you let them include these proteins in this vac in this, in their vaccines, they may cause ADEM, they may cause autoimmunity against brain proteins. And we don't want that, uh, especially if you vaccinate during pregnancy, because then what's going to happen if the mom develops, starts developing antibodies, et cetera, or the child does against her own brain. And uh, he never wrote back to me. And uh, however, uh, he did then a few days later make an announcement that he needed eight more months for the Zika vaccine. So nice. like, right. So they heard me once. I figured if I did a, uh, you know, I, I did a peer reviewed publication this time, maybe they would, maybe they would take it, take it into account. Apparently not. Uh, to my knowledge, none yeah. of the none of the spike protein. Um, they just put the spike protein in as a structure. Uh, they they don't have to have the spike protein for the immune system to see the epitopes. They they could they could have done this with with other kinds of RNAs, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm I'm a little confused why they ignored the obvious here. So uh, what else did you find that that sticks out that you remember? Um, well, you know, from your article, it, it really did stick out to me ab about how many were of uh, the proteins were related to the adaptive immune system. And then when we get into there, we get into the major histocompatibility complexes and things that we already are very well aware of with other research on vaccine injury that's involved in the way these antigens are presented. Yeah, that's sad. I'm sad when I, whenever I think about it. I'm sad to, to, you know, I was sad then, and I'm sad now to think about uh, the po the possibility about what could have been avoided. So. Um, oh, it's heartbreaking, and and it's unpredictable um, because oftentimes we're not going to see the damage for, for months, even years, and um, unless it's an immediate anaphylaxis, and and that's, I take this all back to children and how they're being damaged and. Um, it just depends on the timing of, of exposure, the symptoms we see. Yeah, absolutely. So with, with these deaths all clustered in healthcare workers that have had the vaccine after they had exposure to the virus, that seems real. That, uh, to me, that seems real to many people in the medical community. That seems absolutely real. And uh, on Monday, I have a special guest who has a new hypothesis on how that's going to happen, or why that was going to happen. It's an alternative to pathogenic priming but it may be a, a complementary uh, alternative instead of an exclusionary alternative. Um, so I'm excited about that interview that's coming up. Um, so it, it, are you talking about after they get vaccinated and then they're exposed or exposed without the vaccination? Uh, this, this, this MD's concern is in, in people that had previously had coronavirus. So a, okay, a lot of okay. a lot of people in the medical community are, are saying, I don't care what the CDC says. I don't care what the 
of med- the rest of the medical community says, I'm not going to vaccinate somebody who has had a, a coronavirus infection. It, this is well, how do we know who's had that? Because it's so prevalent. It's usually a mild cold. Right. Well, for the people that you absolutely know, right? Would, you, know, or you, mm-hmm. you, you think you absolutely know? <laughs> right. But technically speaking, they're talking about the people that have been given a medical diagnosis of COVID. That's what that is. Whatever that bucket list is, that those are the people that they're saying, probably a bad idea because of the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve the rest gotcha. of the conversations uh, till, till Monday. Monday. But, um, what do you think we should do? How do we get out of this mess? We've got this vaccine. There's there's this push to vaccinate everyone. The reality is, the more they vaccinate, the more people they're going to find that are susceptible to injury. What then is going to happen is vaccine res- resistance is going to increase because every time a person gets hurt or dies, that community around that person becomes vaccine risk aware. Um, wh- how do we get out of this? And that's a loaded question. Um, I wish I had the answer. It's, in my opinion, when you have a 99.9% survival rate in most populations, there's really no reason to take the risk when we have not properly identified the risks of vaccination. So many more studies need to be done to identify just the items that you have brought up about and testing people for antibodies, having an unvaccinated and a vaccinated group and and seeing how this is truly affecting uh, the human system in regards to self autoimmunity. So if if I were a, um, if someone in my family came down with anaphylaxis or with autoimmunity that appeared to, and they died or they didn't die, I would immediately try to get, you know, some of the serum plasma preserved to look for cross-reactive antibodies all right. They, it seems to me that this should be built into the vaccine program, right? Oh, because brilliant. they're doing post-market surveillance, right? They're enrolling people yep. still in, in the two-year vaccine safety study that's going on, right? They, they really need to have measures of mechanism built into the science. Other, this is the solution for me because then we, don't, we can end the incessant, irrational argumentation that's fractionating society. Then enough instances, mm-hmm. just like with the uh, H was it the H one N one flu no. vaccine yeah. in Europe that led to autoimmunity yeah. uh, against the orexin receptors in the brains of those families. Mm-hmm. Those families were compensated. There's still people in the United States in the medical community that are saying, "Oh, but that was never proven." That's not true. Yeah. Whatever your definition mm-hmm. of proof is, those families were compensated for injury with cause. And so the legal definition of proof, that, that was definitely determined, yes, the autoimmunity against orexin receptor established by research by Stanford researchers, Stanford University, mm-hmm. that's a, a, a smoking gun. So why don't we just look for them? Look for them. We have the list of epitopes to look for. We have the, you know, from my, from my study and from uh, Darsha Kanduk's study and others, we, we know what to look for. Why not create a panel of uh, reactive antibodies and we see, you know, uh, antigens and see if there's reactive antibodies that cross-react to the virus and cross viral epitope and cross-react to, to the proteins. More knowledge, to me, is always better because then we can screen, right? If somebody's had the first vaccine, then we can say, oh, now we have this panel. Listen, if you're considering the second vaccine, you probably want to take this panel. Or if you've had if you've had the the infection, take the panel and see if you have these autoimmune conditions, right? If you're developing towards autoimmunity, why not screen? I mean, same thing with aluminum. We have aluminum patch testing. Why don't we pa- test for aluminum, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, it comes back to risk versus benefit in medicine. And we do not have any data to help us make decisions as clinicians today and on the background of the patient. So with this research, I mean, this wonderful research that you've published this this year in regards to that, why is pharma, the healthcare system, not creating a panel like that so we can learn from this information? And because at some, I I overall don't support vaccinations the way they are right now. However, there could be a time and a place that we need a vaccination. And so why not use this time to gather this data so we can truly make our society healthier? You know, I'm really moved that you said that. You lost a child and you still say that. I think that's so strong and beautiful of you. 
I really do. You know, I think that's just amazingly brave of you to say that. Um, you know, and, and so you thank you for that. You you, you mentioned uh, uh, risk benefit. Uh, the problem, as I see it, is that medicine thinks that it's a risk benefit, or at least they think that the society thinks that the risk benefit argument is enough, and it's not. We really need people that study the balance of risk problem. It's a balance of risk problem. There are going to be people that die from flu. There are going to be people that die from COVID. There are going to be people that die from measles. You know, you, you can't, you're not a bad person if you say, yes, people die from measles. And it is, uh, yep. you're a bad person if you say, yes, people die from measles and I'm not going to give them vitamin A. You're a bad, right? <laughs> How about that? Right. right? So right, treatment seems to fall by the wayside. And like I said earlier, me medicine should be complementary. It should be prevention and treatment, right? Tre early treatment in COVID was poo-pooed by those who needed to have a bad situation to promote their vaccine. That's sadistic. That's sick. That's really sick that they fought against the treatment. And you know, oh, those, those yeah. people who fought against hydroxychloroquine, which now we have more studies, ivermectin, we have more studies, those people that fought against early treatment should be so proud of the world that they have now helped create because it's their oh. responsibility. They get to own that. That's their problem. And they don't, they're not in a position to fix it. They're only in a, as far as I can tell, they're in a position to make it worse. So, so. Absolutely. We need I to am. look at this from a complementary, not either or, but. A and B, prevention and treatment. Uh, we, we need to look at it as a balance of risk where, yeah, it's bad to have something bad happen from a vaccine and it's bad to have something from happen from a pathogen. Instead of taking polar opposite views, which is like arguing in La La Land about, you know, who's better, the star-bellied sneeches or the sneeches that have none upon theirs, you know, the, let's just get along here. And I don't mean that in a naive way. I mean, we need to start pulling in the same direction. If you think that you hate anti-vaxxers, be careful because someone in your family is just one shot away from becoming an anti-vaxxer. You are exactly right. Absolutely. We could take the research you've done, test for these autoantibodies. We could institute um, the nutritional literature that we know, vitamin D, vitamin C, selenium, zinc, and those things um, that with even out a medication may be preventative. And um, and then we know we have two great medicines, probably more that um, are preventative and would take the risk out of, of that, the vaccine reactions and long-term consequences that we're absolutely unaware of at this time. Yeah, I, I appreciate I, that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, with, with my daughter passing away, oh, I would have much preferred her to pass away for, from pertussis or measles, something like that. But to know that you force all of these toxic chemicals that have never been studied onto your child and actually end up murdering them. You know, for those people who can't. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you just, you, you can't rationalize it. At well, all. you can't because you have people that are pitching prevention all day long, but they won't prevent vaccine injury. The, the focus right. on prevention is just prevent, uh, you know, prevent lifelong natural prevent. immunity, right? So that we prevent yeah. deaths in these people, but we're not going to worry about or admit or we're going to deny these specific events over here because these events over here will make it less likely that people take a vaccine uptake. Now, I draw a limit when it comes to hurting children. I won't tolerate it, not a day in my life. But I also draw a limit when my reputation is drawn into question. I was recently a witness in a trial that's a very important trial. And the lawyer pulled up something that some special master said about me not being an MD, something some special master said about, I wouldn't know that Michael Bailey, whose picture is right here, Michael Bailey uh, uh, didn't die, you know, did, uh, his vaccine did not uh, develop uh, a ALS. Uh, when I was arguing it was GBS, uh, Gambare syndrome. Um, it's totally superficial, total argument from authority. 
total argue, appeal to authority unless you're a, if, unless you have a degree in public health unless you have an md you're not entitled to opinion in this society just sit down and shut up that's a, basically what it has forget all the fact that i did over 100 research studies at the university of pittsburgh i focused on the pathophysiology of disease in my research forget the fact that people used to come to me to figure out how to do their science better i couldn't possibly review all the literature on als and uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome and figure out that the literature has 11 criteria, right, for ALS versus GBS and all but one uh -huh. went in the favor of GBS. I couldn't possibly have used deductive logic and reasoning. So, you know, the, it, uh, to me, the way I look at it is, you know, I propose plan B, basically plan B to, to take down current public health by building an alternative public health that is actually viable. And if you're interested in finding it, look at plan B. But when they come after my reputation, the only reason why I care about my reputation is because my sons have the same last name as me. And I want my sons to be able to look up for me. And I'm nobody's fool. I would never have right. put into, into the vaccine injury cases the argumentations that I did as if I was the sole authority. But I'll tell you this, right. when the other side, when HHS has to start plagiarizing to fight against me, that's happened in a case, yeah. I think we're winning. <laughs> so we got them against the ropes. We're going to inject rational discourse into medicine and science and bring science back to medicine, whether they like it or not. We have to. Um, one thing I find is that, of course, since my daughter has passed away, I all I do is review medical literature and this has been you know over 10 years however physicians that are working 60 to 80 hours a week do not access the literature they depend on what they've been taught in medical school what they're taught by other colleagues it's very rare that someone's gonna go home after a 10-hour very stressful day and True. stay up for hours on end studying what is most recent and they, they might check the CDC website they might, they might Which, check to see, they'll, they'll appeal to authority or read the lead <laughs> newsletter from the AMA. They might do that. They might go to Medscape. Right, that private CDC organization that makes a lot of money. I yeah. had no idea. That's the website I checked. I had plenty of friends that um, talked about vaccine injury um, prior to my daughter passing away. And I was taught in medical school to not, or actually in residency, to not, to advise my patients not to access literature on the web on websites except the cdc and uh you could never imagine that what you were taught was bogus yeah. in med school it really wasn't about how the body worked at the cellular level mm -hmm. and uh um so i trusted the cdc website 100 percent. i had to you have to millions okay. of americans do millions yeah. of americans trusted the cdc when they we put our faith and confidence in them to develop a test for oh. coronavirus as well. The test that failed and caused the spread of coronavirus and, you know, millions, millions yeah. trusted Redfield when when uh, he said that, uh, yeah, we're on top of this. You know, in July, Sanjay Gupta uh, had an interview with Redfield and uh, we don't have a tape of it, but we have a tape of Sanjay Gupta telling his colleagues, I couldn't believe it. I was stunned when he said that what we need right now in America in July of 2020 is a viable testing program for coronavirus. So, <laughs> foot and mouth. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, is there anything else that you wanted to share about uh, the pathogenic priming disease enhancement? How much of it? I, I had a question. How much of it did you think? Do you think is potentially autoimmunity versus this antibody dependent enhancement, where the virus makes it more likely that it can infect immune cells and it, it, or cells, that the actual infection makes future infections uh, more, more likely? Um, well, I almost think it goes hand in hand. Um, you know, the more inflammation you have, the more likely you are to react or create these autoantibodies. Yeah. Um, so... If, that's fine. Yeah. We don't have a quantitative, yeah. you know, relative importance. You know, Jim Neuenschwander uh, taught me that mm -hmm. if you have just the spike protein, all of your IgG is going to be mounted against that small array of epitopes. But if you have a viral, the, the virus infection, you have a broader dispersion of IgG 
allocated to the, all the different epitopes from the virus. So you're more likely to have a longer sustaining healthy immune reaction in the future. See, the, remember, the, the path, pathogenic priming disease enhancement happened in vaccine trials. They, if they right. Took the, right. It was vaccine first and then the virus. But if you right. did the virus first and then the virus again, that's that's happened over and over and over again. We don't send, tend to see disease enhancement. We might see autoimmunity from a secondary infection uh, in rare instances. But this was such a strong reaction in the animal studies. Right. Um, yeah. And, and it really goes back to the eosinophils. Is that correct? Yeah. Which I find fascinating because I have a son who's been vaccine injured um, with multiple things. And um, one problem is the eosinophilic asthma, um, which I find very interesting. Um, and then to see that with these studies here and interleukin-5 and then the TH17 system. And that's what's fascinating to me, too, when I first started getting into this research about how we were clueless about how the immune system worked when we started this program. We have learned some. We didn't even know what toll-like receptors were. Yeah. And it's just fascinating how we have thrown all of these chemicals into adults and children without having a clue about how the body works. It's, it's, I'm glad that you brought up IL-5. It's key to the discussion. So in the animal studies that found disease, uh, antibody-dependent disease enhancement, or just disease enhancement, I guess it was called at the time, um, mm -hmm. IL-5 was a key indicator. And I've read the non-human primate studies, the rhesus macaque studies that were finally put out by Moderna and Pfizer. And they looked at a bunch of interleukins, and they looked at a bunch of cytokines, but they didn't look at IL-5. Uh, why didn't they measure IL-5, right? And if, right. right? And so if you look at the early trial studies in Pfizer, I think it was Pfizer where the, the elderly, the older Americans who, had, uh, who were 55 and above had 10 times the serious adverse event compared to, uh, in the second dose, compared to the first dose, mm -hmm. right? But the younger, so those under 55, they only had a 3.4-fold. Well, it was mostly the, an the older animals that had a problem with pathogenic right. priming. So there seems to have been a safety signal that the FDA missed there, if anybody's interested in following up with the FDA on that. Uh, eosinophilia, it, hyper eosinophilia and, and hypo eosinophilia um, are syndromes. There, there, there's syndromes that uh, are absolutely important. Uh, asthma is one of them, GERD is another in the digestive tract. and. <clears throat> You know, when I when I was sick back in uh, was it February, I developed GERD, and uh -huh. uh, I, I I treated it naturally, but uh, I developed GERD symptoms anyway. And um, Judy Mikovits knows a lot uh -huh. about ways of shutting down eosinophilia. She's got a paper called Molecular Pathogenesis and Treatment Perspectives for Hyper eosinophilia and hyper eosinophilic syndromes she doesn't she's not on the paper but she sent it to me it's in the Ooh, uh, I would love to see that international too. journal of molecular sciences um, <clears throat> so if, if there are ways that we can calm down the eosinophilia then perhaps the speculation is I'm not saying it but perhaps the speculation is that uh, we might see a reduction in um, problems with the vaccine and with the Infection, is that what you're saying? Um, I, I think so. And we also see this eosinophilia with rheumatoid arthritis and irritable bowel disease, all of which have been on the rise over the years. Um, I think it's interesting what the ivermectin does and the steroids do. And I'm not quite sure why we don't give ivermectin with the vaccination if they're going to give the vaccination or just have it available. Well, the, the ivermectin, the mechanism of action of, of ivermectin specifically is that it blocks the viral entry. And so the argument would be that it would confound the vaccine. Um, and uh, so a, I was on a conference call with Pierre Corey and one of the medical doctors was hammering in the comments, you please don't take ivermectin if you take the vaccine, it'll stop the vaccine from working. Um, Really? Yeah. Hmm. So here you go. Molecular pathogenesis and treatment perspectives for hyper eosinophilia, hyper eosinophilic Ew. syndromes. It's in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences. 
So there's one for those that want to take a screenshot of that. Um, so, yeah, so if, if ivermectin confounds the vaccine specifically because the vaccine has the, has the spike, you know, um, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that he's right, though. Yeah, this doctor is wrong because this, the, 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 the little lipid, the little lipid particles don't have the spike protein on the surface, so they don't use the same receptor. So that doctor was yeah. wrong. That, so that, it'd just be about preventing uh, the virus from getting into the nucleus to increase all the other inflammatory components. Well, it would it would not in the nucleus, but in the cell. The if, you, if you take ivermectin, it prevents this virus from getting in the cell. But if you take ivermectin, it should not prevent the vaccine from getting in the cell because the vaccine doesn't have the spike protein on the surface. So an okay. MD was wrong. I'm saying it right here <laughs> on, on Breaking Science that this MD was wrong. Oh, man, I wish I realized that when I was in the you know, in a conversation with somebody, you don't think about it. Man, I, I could have had him. I could have said, listen, let's learn together here, buddy. So I don't know any, I don't know any, I would have said something smart ass, like I don't know any uh, COVID-19 vaccine that has the spike protein on the surface uh, made by Pfizer or Moderna. So I don't know what you're talking about. But, um, but anyway, ivermectin specifically would prevent the enhance to potentially prevent disease enhancement, I would imagine, because yes. if you have a resident residual or new infection, and you get the vaccine, then you're not going to get a double dose. You're not going to have the infection and the vaccine. It's, it's less likely. You probably still get some viremia. You probably get still some, some viral replication in the, some of the cells, but it should dampen it down. So anyway, I think you're doing great work. It's such a, a pleasure to Thank talk you. with you, Stephanie. Uh, you know, uh, people can find you on, um, on, on, on social media, I take. Is there a website or something people can find you at? Um, no, I'm pretty much in transition right now. I shut down a integrated clinic about two years ago and transitioning more into research and less patient care. Um, still doing some patient care, but um, I, I'd really like to contribute educating others. Well, we need people like you at IPAC. So if you're an angel and you want to fund somebody to the tune of, uh, I don't know, name your price, $80,000 a year for a full-time research assistant for Dr. Jack. You know where to find awesome. me, ipaknowledge.org. <laughs> I need an angel. Steph does great work doing research on your behalf. Let's get some more donations into IPAC and find an angel for me because she'll do this stuff full time. And, you know, we have so many different projects. Yeah, I would love to oh, have you. you. I, I wish we could afford you right now. She didn't mention 80000 I just guessed. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in, in all seriousness, people, if you go to ipaknowledge.org, you can support the kind of research that we do. And if you like the podcast, go to the patreon.com forward slash WWDNYK. If you have a guest that you'd like to suggest, make the suggestion. I'd be happy to talk with anybody about almost anything related to ways that we can make science and medicine better. Um, Stephanie, thank you so much. It was great talking with you. I appreciate it. Thank you so time. much. Really enjoyed today. And I look forward to talking to you in the future. You got it. We'll have you back. Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.